Uh, hi, guys. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Nick Egan Times. We have an awesome guest on this episode. We have Alex Janafilu, Chairman of the Republican Party, Hamilton County, judge, lawyer, proud Greek, proud family man, a mad fan of the Cincinnati Bengals and Reds. Alex, Mr. Chairman, thank you for coming on here and giving up your time to be with me. I really appreciate it. How's it all going over there? Well, Nick, it's good to be with you. Uh, everything's going well here, as you know. Uh, in North America, it's cold where we are in the Midwest, uh, but things are going just fine, and I'm honored to be with you on your podcast. Thank you. Um, and how was your holidays and the Christmas as well? Well, all of that went very well. Um, you know, we're blessed with a, with a big, beautiful family. You know all about that. And um, we, uh, you know, we, we were, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, coronavirus issue has has kept us apart a little more than we would like, but we were able to, to squeeze in some good holiday celebrations and to uh, enjoy the, uh, the time together. So overall good, uh, we've managed to stay mostly healthy. Uh, like the rest of the world, we're, uh, we're trying to get vaccinated right now, but uh, overall things are good. That's awesome. So getting straight into it, if you could just for the listeners, um, tell them who is Alex Chernofilou? Well, uh, first and foremost, he's second cousin to Nick Egan. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Alex uh, Triantafilou is uh, 49 uh, years old. Uh, he's a, an attorney, a lawyer here in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, in the Midwestern United States. Uh, I have been a practicing attorney <laughs> since 1996. Uh, upon graduating law school, I uh, became a prosecuting attorney here uh, locally in the prosecuting attorney's office. I then became very politically active. Uh, Nick, as you uh, know, and your listeners probably would be interested to know, I'm a strong Republican. Uh, and I am uh, been active with the Republican Party for more than 20 years. So uh, after, uh, after some period of activism, I was uh, named a judge here in the local county court system in Hamilton County, where I served for four years. After that, I uh, resigned my judgeship and went back into the private practice of law and also took the, uh, the helm of the leadership of my local Republican organization here in Southwest Ohio. Again, for uh, the uninitiated, Ohio is a key battleground swing state. Uh, I've had a front row seat for lots of great uh, political things in my life, been very fortunate. But uh, that's my political and legal career. On the family side, uh, proudly married to my wife, Jennifer. We have a son, Michael, who's 21 years old. And um, we uh, are living happily here in Midwestern, the Midwestern United States. That's awesome. Can you take us back to where it all began for you? So you are obviously a proud Greek man, proud family man. How did it all begin for you? So starting back when you were younger. Well, uh, you know, I am a proud Greek American, that's for sure, a proud Greek for sure. Um, you know, my parents uh, um, really both uh, full-blooded Greeks. My mother born and raised in Athens, my father uh, born here in the United States, the two Greek immigrant parents, uh, relatives of yours again, Nick. Um, so we, um, you know, we grew up in a fairly modest situation here in, in Cincinnati. Uh, where it all began for me was just a great love of, uh, of my country and politics and the political process. And like a lot of other Greeks, Nick, you know, um, we, uh, I think Greek people have an innate sense of community and politics. Uh, we obviously as, as proud Greeks know that, um, that the Greek culture has, has contributed so much to, uh, to the world, uh, in the sense of, um, of uh, self-governance and democracy. So I think for me, it started as a pretty young guy as a political junkie. And uh, that uh, ultimately, you know, for me started this political career that's, that's been interesting for me. And I don't mean to talk only about those things, but I'm, I'm hoping those are interesting to your listeners. You know, I've had the high privilege and honor of meeting a couple of United States presidents, uh, even most recently uh, met with and and uh, had a short communication with President Trump. So I've been fortunate in that regard, uh, but it all really started with two immigrant parents who taught me a love for, for uh, my country and, uh, and encouraged me to, uh, to chase my dreams. And I did that. That's awesome. Where is your favorite place in Greece to go back to that you would recommend to listeners to go to? Well, <clears throat> I think everybody has to see Santorini once in their life. Um, so I loved Santorini. And then uh, our last trip to Greece, Nick, we went to a smaller, less uh, less touristy island called Milos 
That's M-I-L-O-S, the island of Milos. Uh, and that is a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, much, uh, uh, you know, less uh, touristy, less inhabited. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, the secret's out, so it's getting busier every summer. But uh, don't miss Santorini and definitely don't miss the beautiful island of Milos. It has a couple of very famous landscapes that that uh, many of us have seen in popular culture and in TV commercials and the like for many years. But the uh, island of Milos uh, has these, uh, these amazing um, vistas and views. Uh, not quite as, as good as, uh, as Santorini, but it definitely has something to offer. So those are two can't miss spots. And then of course, you know, I know some people don't love Athens. I love Athens. Athens is a busy, bustling, uh, crowded city full of, um, great history and architecture and, and uh, you know, thriving uh, uh, downtown with uh, wonderful tavernas. And if you can get past some of the traffic and maybe even some of the smog, it's a wonderful place. Sounds awesome. I haven't been there myself personally. So it's a meal I'll send you. I've been to Athens and Santorini, et cetera, but I haven't been there. So I'd love to go there one day. Well, I encourage you and others to go. Uh, and of course, at the moment, uh, I think Greece is shut down it's certainly shut down to Americans. I suspect it's shut down mostly to foreign visitors. But uh, uh, once uh, once we all get past this uh, this crazy COVID nineteen, we can uh, maybe all resume a normal life, and that would include some travel uh, to the places we're talking about. All right, so excited for that! Can't wait. You're a lifelong resident of Western Hamilton County, in with obviously in Cincinnati. Cincinnati. What was it like growing up there your whole life, and what stories and memories can you share of that? Well, uh, you know, again, for, for people listening, uh, you know, halfway around the globe, uh, the reason uh, that's part of my biography is that the Cincinnati region where we live is, has got this fairly clear delineation between the western part of the city and the eastern part. Uh, these are somewhat stereotyped um, um, uh, concepts that I'll discuss briefly, but uh, the reason we talk about the western part of Hamilton County, western part of Cincinnati, is it tends to be the more uh, uh, working class, blue collar um, section of, uh, of Hamilton County. And uh, growing up there meant everything. Uh, it, it, I, I hope it, uh, it taught me and my, my family, my brothers, my child, um, you know, a, um, a, a work ethic uh, and a, a kind of a steadfast kind of traditional um, work ethic. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's what that meant. Uh, my favorite memories uh, growing up, uh, <laughs> interesting enough, are, are the travel that we were able to do, the limited amount of travel my dad was able to afford and provide for us back to Greece and other places. So those are wonderful memories. And, um, and you know, Nick, I can't, I, I have to say this, uh, you know, I, my memories really are of, of kind of the international nature of my family, just uh, the relationship that I I've so thoroughly enjoyed with you and with your sibling. Um, you know, the idea that uh, we might live here in uh, Midwestern United States uh, in, uh, and in the middle of flyover country, as Americans like to say it, but we always felt that we had a greater connection, whether it was in Greece or, uh, or with our, or, you know, our family there in Australia. So uh, some of my fondest memories here are just having those uh, relationships outside of our, our, our small little uh, enclave here uh, in Western Cincinnati. Yeah, that's awesome. And I agree too, vice versa with the United States and specifically you and the rest of the family. It's been amazing. Um, you completed your arts degree from the University of Cincinnati and then your law degree from Salmon P. Chase, P. Chase sorry, College of Law. How did you enjoy the process of becoming a lawyer and what made you decide you wanted a career in law? Well, uh, the process... Uh... It's, uh, you know, it's in the United States, at least it's fairly grueling in the sense that it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of reading, comprehension and writing. Um, there's a myth about uh, about uh, lawyering. Um, and I know certainly I know the legal process very different in foreign countries uh, from the United States. But uh, here there's a myth that one must be, uh, you know, uh, good at arguing or uh, good on their feet or uh, to, to be a good lawyer. And I've, I've told uh, law students and prospective law students this for years that the skills necessary to get through law school and ability to grind through um, hours of reading and regurgitating what you've read and comprehending what you've read in a rather um, expedited way and delivering uh, a result, or excuse me, delivering uh, something coherent based on what you've read. So 
Uh, that, that part can be grueling. It's four years of undergraduate education here, and then it's an additional three years of specific training uh, as a lawyer. So, um, you know, I found the process, um, it's been a while now, it's been more than 20 years, but uh, I find the process, uh, I found it to be enlightening. Uh, it opened my eyes to lots of things I didn't really understand before, and I think a legal education has great value. So, um, I, you know, again, very, very, very good experience at both of those uh, those academic institutions, and uh, they continue to serve me well here as I practice law. Uh, you know, into my twenty fifth year. Okay, that's awesome. Um, and since nineteen ninety six, you have been practicing law. Which six years of that you were handling hundreds of cases in court every day? How did you find that and enjoy that? Well, being in the courtroom is a unique experience for people who don't who don't go. Um, for those of us who, who uh, spent a lot of our careers there, uh, it's still very exhilarating. Um, you know, if, if you uh, if you love and appreciate the uh, the process of administering justice, as I do, uh, I've loved every every minute of my courtroom time. Really, I, I've uh, and every time I get a chance now to go to court to go to court with a with a uh, client, which isn't as often as as you'd like, especially with COVID, we've shut down the the courts here, but I definitely miss uh, being in the courtroom when I'm not there. So uh, I have lots of stories, Nick, I could, could, could bore you all day with them. But, um, you know, I, as a, as a judge, I was a judge here. I, I, uh, I sat not on one, but on two capital death cases. And I, I say that uh, not to be morbid, uh, because I know that the, the death penalty still is of interest internationally, that, that we here in the United States, a a westernized uh, democracy still has the death penalty. As a judge, you don't get the, you know, you you don't make the law, you enforce it. So others decide that the death penalty uh, should be part of the uh, part of the uh, the law. But uh, as a judge, you know, you're you're bound by the rules established by those who uh, who pass the laws. So uh, I sat on not one but two death penalty cases. A judge, both are probably the most memorable cases I've ever been involved with in my career, primarily because. The facts were particularly heinous. Uh, one was a uh, brutal abduction and rape of a, of, a, uh, of a young girl, 15 years old. The other one was uh, the brutal, uh, very brutal homicide and rape, frankly, of a little three-year-old boy. So those things, uh, those things obviously stay with you and will for the rest of my life. Yeah, and I could imagine they're not easy decisions either, right? You've got to obviously take into all the considerations and the facts. So, yeah, respect for handling that as well. In Australia, just for your own knowledge, um, capital murders, you can't do that in Australia currently. So we do it just where you get life or certain life sentences that add up. Um, okay. In January 2003, nearly 18 years ago, you moved to the position of administrator of the Hamilton County Clerk's Office. This meant, Mr. Chairman, you led a staff of over 230 employees back then and managed a budget of over $15 million, which is about a, which is about $21 million these days with inflation. With office, you collected revenue of over $130 million, which is about $180 million this day. How did you enjoy that? And what memories can you share of that? Well, gosh, you really have uh, gone over my bio pretty effectively there, Nick. So, um yeah, that was uh, that was a period where I transitioned uh, it really into the political realm and, and took took uh, the administrative day to day leadership role of a large bureaucratic office. Again, I I was about 31 years old. And I had about 330 employees. We did manage that budget that you've talked about, um, multi million dollar budget. It was quite the experience. Uh, uh, again, I uh, some of these things have faded into memory, but. Um, uh, anyone who's ever managed people knows that that can be some of the hardest work that you'll ever do because, uh, you know, people are unpredictable, emotional, a uh, lot of other things um, that, uh, that, um, that, you know, that, that come with managing personnel. So uh, for me, you know, my memories of that are, are mostly positive, uh, except for, you know, those times where you had to discipline people or uh, terminate people's employment um, you know, during my tenure uh, managing that office, we found an employee who had uh, who had been stealing uh, tens of thousands of, of uh, dollars, uh, and it had done it in a very um, oh well, there's not a good way to steal, I guess, but in a very sneaky kind of way, and uh, taking advantage of people being on vacations and other things. But ultimately, an audit caught that individual, 
and you know having to having to bring in uh, criminal investigators and having to uh, fire that individual that's obviously a, a key memory of those years but uh, what comes most away from all of that for me is and again anyone listening would know this but if you have to manage people uh, that is uh, that that can be a real challenge because the uh, managing uh, people comes with that you know with that whole that whole set of problems I've already discussed. Awesome. How did you get involved in politics, public life, and the Republican Party? Yeah. Well, you know, Nick, uh, this goes back to our shared uh, Greek heritage here. Two thousand, excuse me, two thousand in 1984. In 1984, I was a 13 year old kid, and my parents uh, put me on an airplane and sent me back to stay with my cousins in Greece in Athens. And uh, again, uh, Nick, I'm, I don't, I can't remember your exact year of birth, but 1984. Again, I was 13. A lot of big things were happening in the world, in my world, at 13. First of all, at 13, you're kind of coming of age. You're not a kid anymore, but you're certainly not an adult. And uh, at that point in the presidential election, Ronald Reagan was running for a second term here as president of the United States. He was wildly popular. One of the reasons I'm a Republican is because of Ronald Reagan. But he was wildly popular. Uh, his opponent selected a female running mate, Geraldine Ferraro. First time that an American running for president had selected a, a running mate that just wasn't a white male. So it was quite quite interesting, uh, you know, going back 26 years ago. And uh, that uh, really uh, caught my attention as a young man. And I started paying attention. More, more importantly, Nick, they were conducting an election in Greece. Uh, and uh, again, not having uh, been to your wonderful country, I don't know what elections are like there, but I can tell you in Greece, uh, they're, they're, um, the, 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 uh, the ferocity of the campaigning and the yard signs and the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the competition among the various political parties was wildly interesting to me because we, you know, in the United States, we have two political parties. Sometimes a third will creep in. I know we're one of the few places in the world where it's like that. Over there, you know, there were 15 political parties, give or take. So that really, really intrigued me. I thought, how do they make this work? And I started to look at it and talk to my uncle. And then I realized they had an uncle who was a communist and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I love my uncle. Sure. My uncle was a great guy, but uh, he was a communist in the sense that he was for workers' rights and not, uh, uh, you know, not, not a Stalinist uh, dictator, but, but more someone who believed in workers' rights. Now, obviously, I re have rejected over the course of my life, that worldview, but uh, realizing that there are different people who see the world different ways uh, was uh, really prompted an interest in politics that I carried forward and still do to this day. And that's 100% a true story. I'm a political junkie largely as a result of that trip. And uh, I came back at 13 and 14 and had a lot of questions from my dad and a lot of questions of my own. And by the time I was uh, 18, 19 years old, I don't think anybody knew more about politics at my age than I did. I say that uh, I say that uh, immodestly, but uh, I uh, nevertheless uh, stayed very, very involved and, 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 and likely will for the rest of my life. I, I enjoy the political process and I believe strongly in self-governance and, uh, and, and really enjoy the process of uh, give and take that occurs in the political arena. That's, that's amazing. That's an amazing inspirational story. Um, being in politics, obviously it can be quite vicious and you need to have very thick skin um with you have obviously an abundance by doing it and being in it by not letting especially anything taken personally how do you best deal with that and what have you best learned from it with your experience well that's a hard that's the hardest part of it well there's a lot of, there's a couple of things i don't really love about it but uh, look you do get criticized you get criticized often and uh, you get criticized publicly social media has made it so that uh you know on any given day there's somebody out there spewing hate um you know, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about yourself. Uh, you, 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 you're glad to have a supportive family that you know is not judging you based on some of these ridiculous things said about you in social media. Uh, so um, you have to have thick skin. Uh, it's not always the most pleasant part of the job. But, uh, you know, Nick, uh, I, I think the best revenge is to live well. That's my, one of my life mottos. <laughs> and uh, I do my best to live well. I fight for what I believe in. I don't always win, uh, but uh, when we uh, when we do what we think is right and honorable, and we act in a legal, moral, and ethical fashion, that's all we can ask for, and that's all I'm ever going to try to do. And um, anyway, so uh, that thick skin question is a, is a really good one for anybody who's in any sort of public arena. And again, I'm not, um, 
you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not a United States Senator or mayor or anything like that, but in my little corner of the universe here, uh, you know, we, uh, we do play around in, in politics and sometimes that means uh, uh, you're going to get criticized and I'm used to it by now. Um, for the listeners um, everywhere, uh, and this is for me personally, how does the law side of things, so becoming a lawyer, a judge, how does that align with the American politics and the Republican Party and yeah, the Constitution, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, it's a big question and there are probably papers and books on this topic, but I, I've long asked myself why so many lawyers are, are drawn into the political arena. I think there's just a, a, a certain link, obviously, between those passing the laws and then those having to deal with them every single day and enforcement, whether it be in a courtroom or in a contract. Uh, but there certainly is a, an appeal there for lawyers to, to be drawn in. And I also, again, knowing just almost very little, frankly, about the system of justice where you are, but I know where we are, you know, the elections process plays out very much like a, like a courtroom drama in the sense that both sides make their arguments and then the jury decides or a judge decides. And in politics, it's, uh, it's the same. Uh, you know, we have uh, in the American system, again, typically two candidates, but sometimes more, depending on the race, but uh, they're making their pitch. And then the American people at the ballot box, um, you know, the jury, so to speak, or the judge, so to speak, makes a decision. So there's this idea that you're presenting evidence uh, and that evidence ultimately must sway a certain, uh, a certain group. And uh, I think those two, those two things um, uh, are, are what make, uh, what make the, 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 uh, the profession of politician and lawyer sometimes dovetail. Yeah, sure. And in 2004, you started to manage and consult on many political campaigns, beginning, I believe, with Bush and Cheney in 2004 then serving on many other political campaigns up until most recently, which you mentioned earlier, Trump and Pence campaign, which has been the most enjoyable campaigns that have you done and why is that? Oh, um, I haven't really been asked that question. That's a good one. I really did enjoy the 2004 uh, Bush re-election campaign. That was my first, you know, that was the first time I, you know, shook the hand of a sitting United States president. The first time I set foot you know, in the White House, the first time I, uh, you know, got my picture and taken with the president. Those things are when you're, you know, I was 33 years old then. Those things are, 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 are important memories. Um, as I've as I've sort of uh, moved along in my career and gained a leadership role here in my community, you know, they've become a little less fun because uh, <laughs> because the responsibilities are greater, but. Uh, you know, regardless of what the world thinks uh, or Americans think of President Trump, um, he did make uh, he did make himself very available to people at the grassroots level like me. So uh, I really did enjoy the times I, I got to uh, to spend with the president. Uh, you know, I I once greeted him as he descended the steps from Air Force One. That was a real treat for somebody like me. Uh, you know, he did host a, a, a Greek Independence Day celebration every year at the White House something I attended uh, twice, including once taking my mom, you know, to the White House here in, in uh, Washington, D.C. to uh, to hear from and, and, uh, and greet the president. So uh, those are very, very fond memories for me politically. Um, and again, regardless of what you think of, uh, of the, the politician, uh, there's still great respect owed in my mind to the occupants of these high offices. And for that reason, uh, you know, I, some of my greatest memories obviously are around <coughs> around the presidentials. But I'll say one other thing uh, to anybody who's certainly listening and, and cares about any, any career. I've always believed this very strongly. It's about the people. It's never really about the place. It's not about the office. But you know, any, any job that you do like this where you're out and about and you're meeting people, I've met some of the best people uh, that I could ever imagine meeting. And I've got some of the greatest friends, some of the most loyal and dedicated friends and some of the most interesting people. Uh, that I uh, that I can ever imagine knowing as a young as a young uh, attorney, so you know I've been lucky, and uh, those are some of the best memories. The people really are what, what are most memorable to me. That's that's awesome. Um, you've been recognised too for pushing innovations in online communication and the implementation of social media to deliver your political message and messages. This includes finding, fielding, recruiting, and retaining great candidates for the Republican Party. 
How do you work the process of this and what makes a great political candidate in your eyes? Well, uh, great political candidates um, uh, have to do a lot of things uh, well. Um, uh, you know, in the United States, again, fundraising is of, of paramount importance. Again, having no idea, candidly, maybe I should know more, Nick, given our relationship. Maybe when I come there, you can teach me. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, here in the United States, an ability to raise funds, an ability to get people to financially support your campaign uh, through through. Uh, through political donations is, is really important because that's how you get your message out. That's how you buy the various things that you need to be successful. So fundraising, number one. Number two, um, obviously, uh, you know, um, a, a, an allegiance uh, to the principles of our political party or obviously uh, that's a precursor to anything. Other things that make great candidates, uh, you know, a really good work ethic, uh, the ability to communicate effectively, um, you know, at every level, uh, you know, if you're an effective political candidate, you'll be talking with a, uh, a chief executive officer of a major company in the morning, and you'll be, you know, uh, walking through a neighborhood parade in the afternoon or the evening and, uh, and knowing that uh, you have to be able to appeal to all those people. Um, at the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, great candidates um, are typically not born, they're made. So there's a lot of training that goes into helping candidates. And that's one of the things I still very much enjoy about my role. Uh, but um, what does it ultimately take to be a great candidate? You just have to win, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's about. <laughs> How have you um, enjoyed being the chairman and just in public life generally? Yeah I've, yeah, I've enjoyed it a great deal, Nick. It's it's been uh, it's been a great experience for me, um, and uh, something I didn't really know about when I graduated. Uh, High school. Uh, if you'd have said you're gonna your your career at 49 years old is going to be chairman of the Hamilton County Republican Party, I didn't even know they existed. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's uh, it's been a wild ride. I enjoy it a great deal. Amazing. Where do you see life in the United States just generally now, positioned for the future? Well, again, that's a big question, uh, but. Um, you know, I like our position for the future. I, I think, uh, I think what the United States has is remains unique in the world. Um, I'm not sure it's going to stay that way forever, but I do think that uh, we continue to offer uh, leadership and a beacon of hope and liberty. Uh, I think that we continue to be a model for how capitalism can work to lift people up. Uh, we're not perfect. Uh, uh, I don't believe for a second that uh, that we're a flawless uh, nation, but I do believe that. The model that we've established culturally, uh, morally, is one that uh, that uh, can work well for for any country that adopts it. And and I'm very mindful, Nick, of the fact that the people who may be listening are not in the United States and may have alternative views about our, our country. And uh, uh, I think it's incumbent upon Americans to listen to those views so we can maintain, you know, great relationships with our wonderful allies, like the people in your great country. But I do, uh, I do maintain a certain patriotism about my country and uh, that's to be expected, right? A hundred percent, you know, and um, yeah, I really knowing you, um, your personality, you're very open-minded and understand the rest of the views of the world and always are open-minded to things. So from a personal perspective, like, yeah, I really appreciate your opinions as well because they're quite spot on generally. Um, glad to hear, glad to hear. Well, I've, I've got a voter, but not in the United States, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter here, so that's all you need. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Thank um, you. Being at a young age, you are still, where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? Well, you know, I don't have any grandiose plans politically or anything like that. I, um, you know, where I live, it's changing. I'm a Republican here, and my, my area here is trending uh, Democratic, especially uh, under Donald Trump. Now, President Trump won uh, the state of Ohio, won it easily. But in my uh, in my neighborhood here, um, uh, that is in the southwestern part of Ohio, uh, it's it's gotten more democratic, as it has in urban centers across America. We have a big city here in Cincinnati, and that has trended to be more Democrat. So, uh, anyway, where do I see myself? I I see myself continuing to do what I'm doing. I still enjoy the practice of law. Uh, I don't have any plans really to run for anything. I, I think that uh, 
that would be a natural progression for somebody who does what I do. I've, I've run before as a judge, like we've discussed briefly, yeah. uh, but I enjoy just doing what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, I, I hope to play a lot of golf and keep my health and watch my, my son and the rest of my family thrive. That's, that's my main, uh, my main goal here over the next decade. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, Alex, thank you very much for your time today. I do appreciate it. Um, and thanks for coming on here. Well, Nick, it's been a real pleasure and I always enjoy connecting with you and I hope to stay, uh, stay in touch for a long, long time. And anybody listening, greetings from the United States of America. Thanks, Alex. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.